Welcome to AS Statistics in 30 Minutes. I'm Tony Debling and I'm going to take you through the key things you need to know for your examination. The first two questions we're going to look at um, are really about vocabulary. There's not a lot of mathematics as such in it. Explain what is meant by the word population. Well, the population is the complete set of items of interest. Joe needs to conduct a survey to investigate the type of kitchen cleaner people prefer. She wants a random sample of people who use kitchen cleaners. She decides to stand in a busy high street on a Saturday afternoon and attempt to get shoppers to answer her questions. This is called opportunity or convenience sampling. Just picking people as they come out, very convenient for her to get questionnaire responses. Having been unsuccessful in obtaining enough data from this attempt, she tries to look at the electoral register for a town and selects a sample of 50 households to contact. She decides to select every 10th name on the electoral register to add to her sample. Here, Joe has used systematic sampling. We're asked what reasons why this might be unsuccessful. There may not be enough households. There can be inaccuracies in the register and some of the selected households may not respond. What alternative methods could she use? Well, you need to know what random, quota and stratified sampling are, and you need to understand the advantages and disadvantages of each. If you don't know these, then you should look them up and read about them in the textbook. Explain what's meant by a census. Well, a census is when you observe or measure every item in the population. This may be time consuming and expensive. If it involved a destruction test of an item, it will destroy items. And there could be a lot of data to process. The good news, however, is it should give a highly accurate result. Each circuit ball produced at GC Electronics is given a unique serial number. GC Electronics produces circuit balls in batches of 5,000. Before selling each batch, the company tests a random sample of 20 circuits from the batch to check that they will fit into a standard computer slot. Suggest a suitable sampling frame from which to obtain this sample. The sampling frame will be the list of unique board IDs for a batch. With this list of unique IDs, we can number these IDs and then use a random number generator to select which of the boards we're going to use for the sample. Identify the sampling units or the sampling units of the individual boards. Helen is studying the daily mean wind speed for Campbell using the large data set from 1987. If you haven't done so already, I'd recommend you taking a look at the large data set video, which talks you through the details of the large data set. The data for one month are summarized in the table below. So we have wind speed, we have frequency. First of all, we need to understand what this N slash A means this means that on 13 days, the wind speed was not available. Two days, the wind speed was six, three days, the wind speed was seven, and so on. You should also be aware of the TR coding in the large data set. This means trace when measuring rainfall, and you would use such data items, but you'd set them to zero. We're asked to calculate the mean. So these are the data items for which we calculate the mean. We'd start by adding up the frequencies and we'd see that we have data for 18 days of the month. We'd then calculate sigma FW, so 2 times 6 is 12, 3 times 7 is 21, and so on. So that the total of all of the wind speeds measured during the month would be 184 over the 18 days. The mean, therefore, will be sigma FW divided by sigma F, giving us 10.22 knots. You're asked to calculate the standard deviation for these data and to state the units. OK, so this is where we'll use the frequency table formula for the standard deviation. So what we're missing, we know the mean, mu, we've calculated that, we know sigma F. We need to calculate sigma FW squared, so 2 times 6 squared, 3 times 7 squared, and so on. 
and this works out to be 2062. And so the variance will equal sigma fw squared minus sigma f minus mu squared, which gives us 10.11, and the unit will be not squared or square not. It's a nice unit. And the standard deviation is going to be the square root of this number, 3.18 knots. The next question requires interpolation. A random sample of distances travelled to work, 120 commuters from a train station in Devon, is recorded in this table. The distances travelled to the nearest mile are summarised below. So between 0 and 9 miles, there were 10 commuters. Between 10 and 19, there were 19, and so on. We're asked to estimate the median. To do this, we first work out the median position. So that would be 120 divided by 2, equal to 60. We then look at the cumulative frequency. And from this, we can see that the median class, the class in which the median lies, is, is this one here. Although it says 20 to 29, because of the rounding, we have to define the class as being between 19.5 and 29.5 to remove the gaps between the classes in the table. Next, we observe that 29 commuters are travelling less than 19 miles, and there's 43 commuters travelling between 20 and 29. So the median will be in position 31, that's 60 minus 29, out of the 43 items in this class and the class width will be 29.5 minus 19.5 equals 10. So our estimated median will be 19.5 this is the beginning of the median class plus 31 40 thirds that is the fractional position in the class of the median times the class width, which equals 26.38. We're asked to estimate the mean and standard deviation of the distribution. We're told the midpoint of each class was represented by x and its corresponding frequency by f. The midpoint of the lowest class was taken to be 4.75, giving sigma fx equals 3552.5 sigma fx squared equals 138,043.125. Okay, so the estimated mean mu is sigma fx divided by sigma f. We do the calculation. The median is less than the mean, so the distribution has a positive skew. If you consider the distribution curve as looking like a whale, and the tail of the whale is pointing in the positive direction, it means you have a positive skew. If the tail of the whale is pointing in the negative direction, you have a negative skew. Back to the problem at hand of calculating the standard deviation of the distribution. We use this formula, and we simply substitute the values into it to get a standard deviation of 16.56. There's only very basic correlation at AS involving interpretation rather than calculation. So here we have a job evaluation scheme where points are awarded to each job based on the qualifications and skills needed and the level of responsibility. And then the pay will be allocated to the job according to the number of points awarded and before the scheme was introduced a random sample of eight employees was taken and the linear regression of pay on points was y equals 4.5x minus 47. The variable on the x-axis is called the independent or explanatory variable and in this case it will be the number of points awarded for a job the y-axis shows the dependent or the response variable. This is the y and it will be the pay for that particular job. So if we look here, 
we can see that the gradient is positive and that would imply a positive correlation if there's a positive gradient here. We don't know how well it correlates because we haven't calculated the product moment correlation coefficient, but we do know whatever correlation there is is positive. To give an interpretation of the gradient of this regression line, we need to interpret it in context. So we need to explain that an increase in one point in the job evaluation scheme in general gives a rise to an increase of £4.50 pay. And finally, don't forget that these regression lines are only useful for the given range that we're working in. In fact, if you look here, a very small number of points will give negative pay, which clearly um, wouldn't be correct or appropriate. At A level, you should be aware that you only use a regression line to predict a response variable. And this is because the, the formula for a regression line of x on y will be different for the formula of y on x. So if the variables are reversed, you get a different regression line and you'll get different estimates. Let's look at a couple of probability questions. There are 180 students at a college following a computing course and they do various options. Um, we're going to draw a Venn diagram to show those doing system support, set S, those developing software, set D, those doing networking. And we're given the numbers of students taking certain options. Now the secret with these is always to start in the middle. So the point where we start is looking at the students that take all three options. So we can fill in the four where each of these three sets overlap. We know 40 take system support and networking. So this is the section here for system support and networking. We can put 36 in there, so we have a total of 40. 28, take networking and developing software. So we need a 24 in here. 35, take developing software and system support. So we need 31 in here. And from this picture, we can add these three numbers, 24, 4 and 36 to give us 64, subtract it from 81, that gives us 17 to fill in this area here. And likewise for set D and set S, when we have these numbers, we can total these, subtract them from 180, and we get 16. So now we've filled in the, the Venn diagram. Uh, so that's the first part of the question uh, completed. So that was five marks. And from here, we have to calculate various probabilities. So the probability that a student takes none of the extra options, well, that's going to be these 16 students here. So if we choose a student at random, we're going to have 16 out of 180. Networking only, that will be the 17. So the probability of networking only will be 17 out of 180. And finally, we're told that students who take system support and networking are eligible to become technicians. That's these students. The question says, given that the randomly chosen student is eligible to become a technician, so given that the student is taken from this set of students here, find the probability that this student takes all three extra options. So that is this area here, the four. So the given that is always a clear indicator of a conditional probability. The probability of all, given that we have a technician, will be four out of 40 equal to one tenth. Next, a tree diagram problem. We're told a factory buys various components from suppliers A, B and C. And from each of the suppliers, sometimes the components are faulty, other times they're not faulty. 10% of the components come from supplier A, 30% from B, therefore 60% must come from supplier C. Of those coming from A, 9% are faulty. 
those coming from B, 3% to 40. And we've not told the percentage or the probability of a 40 component from supplier C. We can calculate the probability that it comes from A and is 40, the probability that it comes from B and is 40, and we can calculate in terms of P the probability that it comes from C and is 40. And we know if 6% of the components overall are 40, then 0 0.009 plus 0 0.009 plus 0 0.6 P equals 0 0.06, from which we can calculate that P equals 0 0.07, which is 7%. Then we're asked to explain why the event the component was bought from supplier B is not statistically independent from the event the component is faulty. So here, if B and F are statistically independent, then the probability of B and F should be the probability of B times the probability of F. Now we know the probability of B and F is 0 0.009. We know the probability of B is 0 0.3. And we are told that the probability of F is 0 0.06. And this equation doesn't hold, so that they're not statistically independent. This problem is about discrete random variables. A bias spinner can only land on one of the numbers, 1, 2, 3, or 4. The random variable x represents the number that the spinner lands on after a single spin. And the probability that x equals little r equals the probability that x equals little r plus 2, that r equals 1 and 2. We have to find the complete probability distribution for x. So we start with the table. The values of x are 1, 2, 3, and 4. We're given the probability that x equals 2 is 0 0.35, so we can fill in one value. We now need to interpret this piece of information, which tells us that the probability of x equals 1 equals the probability that x equals 1 plus 2, the probability that x equals 3. And it also says that the probability that x equals 2 is the same as the probability that x equals 4. So this second piece of information allows us to fill in the probability that x equals 4. This piece of information means we have to share the remaining probability between these two boxes in equal amounts. So we get 0 0.15 for each of them. Remember that the sum of these values would always equal 1. As an aside, you should be aware that a uniform discrete distribution is one where there's an equal probability for every possible value of a variable. If this were a fair spinner, it would have a uniform distribution and there would be 0 0.25 in each of these boxes. It's a biased spinner, so the probabilities vary. We're told Ambro spins this spinner 60 times and we're asked to find the probability that more than half of the spins land on the number 4 and give our answer to three significant figures. This is going to be a binomial distribution. Remember the conditions for using a binomial distribution. There needs to be a fixed number of trials, in this case 60. There needs to be two outcomes for each trial. In this case, it's going to be the spinner lands on a 4, or it doesn't land on a 4. There needs to be a fixed probability of success. Success is going to be landing on a 4, which will have a probability of 0 0.35. And each time we spin the spinner, it's going to be independent. The probability that x equals 4, and the spinner lands on a 4, is 0 0.35. We let s be the number of times that the spinner lands on the number 4 in 60 spins. So S would be a binomial distribution, the number of trials would be 60, and the probability of success would be 0 0.35. So when we calculate the probability that S is greater than 30, 
that would be 1 minus the probability that s is less than or equal to 30. We have to convert the probability in this way because our cumulative distribution for s always gives us probabilities that s is less than or equal to a certain value. Let's just see how we do that on our class with calculator. We're going to go menu. We're going to choose option 7, the statistics. We don't want binomial PD. We need to go on the next page and look at binomial CD. So we choose option 1. We're going to do a single calculation. So we choose variable 2. Here, the value for x is 30. The number of trials is 60. And the probability of success in a single trial is 0 0.35. That gives us a probability 0 0.9941. Um, and we need to work out 1 minus it. So we go back to menu, we go into standard mode, and we do 1 minus the previous answer equals 5.88 or 5.9 times 10 to the minus 3. So we can see the probability that S is greater than 30 equals 5.00589 to three significant figures. The last part of the question defines a new random variable y which is 12 over x and we have to find out the probability that y minus x is less than or equal to 4. So x takes the value 1 can take the values 1, 2, 3 or 4. It's the same random variable x as in the first part of the question y minus x well y is 12 divided by x so 12 divided by 1 is 12 minus x which is minus 1 12 divided by 2 is 6 minus x which is 2 12 divided by 3 is 4 minus x which is 3 12 divided by 4 which is 3 minus x which is 4 so we get the following values of y minus x y minus x is less than or equal to 4 when x is greater than 1. And x is greater than 1 has a probability of 0 0.35 plus 0 0.15 plus 0 0.35. Let's look at some hypothesis testing with the binomial distribution. So first, Nazir is playing a game with two friends. It's designed to be a game of chance, so the probability that Nazir should win each game ought to be one third. Nazir and his friends play the game 15 times. What's the probability that Nazir wins exactly two games? So, remind ourselves again the conditions for using a binomial distribution, fixed number of trials, Two outcomes for each trial, Nazir wins or he doesn't. Fixed probability of success should be a third in this case, and each game should be independent of the next. Okay, so we let X be the number of games that Nazir wins. It's always good practice to specifically define the random variables that you're using in terms of text. And then X is going to be a binomial distribution 15 trials, probability of success one third. We want to find the probability Nazir wins exactly two games. So we could use 15 C2, a third squared, two thirds to the 13. We can do that calculation. That's using the formula, which is actually in the A level part of the statistics formula booklet. Alternatively, Okay, using the class quiz calculator, we'll choose menu, 7 for the statistics options. Here, because it's the probability x equals 2, I'm going to choose option 4. I'm going to choose a single variable calculation. And here, x equals 2. 
the number of trials is 15 and the probability of success 1 divided by 3 equals and I see the probability is 0 0.0599 and I'm going to round it to 5 next calculate the probability that Nazir wins more than 5 games so here I want the probability that x is greater than 5 that will be 1 minus the probability that x is less than or equal to 5 this is the cumulative probability that we can calculate on our calculator. So let's return to our calculator. We choose option 7. Now, because we want to calculate the probability that x is less than or equal to 5, we need to go on the next page and use the binomial cumulative distribution. So that's option 1 here. I'm going to do a single case. So I choose variable 2 x is 5, n is 15, p is 0 0.3333 and I get that probability is 0 0.61837 and so on. I want 1 minus this value so I go menu 1 to return to standard mode and do 1 minus the previous answer equals 0 0.3816. Nazir claims he has a method to help him win more than a third of the games. To test this claim, three of them played the game 32 times. Nazir won 16 of these games. Stating your hypothesis clearly, test Nazir's claim at the 5% level of significance. So let's state our hypotheses. H0, the null hypothesis, will be that the probability remains as one-third. The alternate hypothesis, H1, will be that the probability is greater than a third. And this tells us to use a one-tailed test, so that all of the 5% level of significance will be used on one tail of the distribution. We let Y be the number of games that Nazir wins. And in this instance, Y will be a binomial distribution generated by 32 trials and the probability of success would be a third. To test the hypothesis we have this test statistic of winning 16 games. So we've got to work out the probability that Nazir wins 16 or more games. So the probability that y is greater than or equal to 16 equals 1 minus the probability that y is less than or equal to 15. Let's calculate the probability that y is less than 15 using our calculator. Menu 7, we choose the statistics. We need to go to the next page and have the cumulative distribution. We're going to calculate for a single variable. Well, the probability is less than or equal to 15. N, the number of trials is 32. 1 divided by 3 for the probability. So we get that for our probability. That Y is less than or equal to 15. We go back into standard mode. So that is menu 1. And we do 1 minus the previous answer equals 0 0.376. So I should really have had 377 there. Either way, it's less than 0 0.05. So this means that there is evidence to reject the null hypothesis and support Nazir's claim. Final question. Um, again, on hypothesis testing. A single observation X is to be taken from a binomial distribution B20P. This observation is used to test the null hypothesis P equals 0 0.3 against the alternate hypothesis P not equal to 0 0.3. Means it will be a two-tailed test. I've drawn a line chart here to show you what such a distribution would look like. The heights of each line tell you the probability of X taking any particular value. 
What we need to do is find the critical region at the 5% significance level for this test. So each tail should have a probability of less than 2.5. So if we start here, we're going to try the probability that x is less than or equal to 2. That will be this bar plus this bar plus this bar. And we calculate that, and we see that is 0 0.035, which is greater than 0 0.025. So this won't be in the critical region. We need to move one here and test again for x less than 1. x less than 1, we test that. That probability is 0 0.00764. That is less than 0 0.025. So that is telling us that this will be the critical region. The critical region here in this tail will be x less than or equal to 1. So now we're going to look at the right hand tail, which is a little bit more complicated than the left hand tail. And we're going to try the 11 here, the probability that x is greater than or equal to 11. We do that calculation, it's 1 minus the probability that x is less than or equal to 10, which is 0 0.01714. That is less than 0 0.025. Okay, so that's certainly in the critical region, 11. Let's have a look at 10 to see whether 10 is in the critical region. The probability that x is greater than or equal to 10 is 1 minus the probability that x is less than or equal to 9. We calculate that and we get 0.04796. That's greater than 0.025. So 10 isn't in the critical region. So that tells us the actual critical region must start at 11. It can't come back one further. So it starts at 11. So the critical region is x less than or equal to 1 and x greater than or equal to 11. The probability that x is less than or equal to 1 is 0 0.00764. The probability that x is greater than or equal to 11 is 0 0.01714. State the actual significance level of this test. Well, that will be the probability that the test statistic is inside the critical region. So probability that it's less than or equal to 1 or greater than or equal to 11. These are mutually exclusive. We add them together to get an actual significance level of 0 0.02479 or in percentage terms, the significance level would be 2.478%. The actual value of X obtained, so if, if the test statistic turned out to be 3, what conclusion would we draw? x equals 3 is not in the critical region. Therefore, there's insufficient evidence at the 5% level to reject the null hypothesis that p equals 0 0.3. That's all, folks. I hope you found it useful. Good luck in your examinations.